Welcome. Welcome. Welcome in, everyone. Welcome to Care Concierge with Care Patrol, where education is the heart of everything we do. We appreciate you being here today with us for an ethics unit. We are today discussing the principles of clinical ethics and their application to practice. Uh, if you are new to Care Concierge or Care Patrol, we are a senior placement and referral agency, and we work much like a real estate agent for assisted living. We share the pricing of options that are matched to our clients' needs with them. Uh, we set tours for them at communities of interest, and then we tour with them in communities of interest, and we do all of this like a realtor does at no fee. We're paid instead by the providers of care with whom we work, uh, and that is how we move forward. And if you've ever tried to look for community placement, you may know that if you call around that those communities do not give you pricing. Instead, they ask that you come in for a tour in order to get pricing. So we're able to cut through that layer and speed the process of information gathering uh, for the client through the work that we do at no charge to them. Uh, that is Care Patrol. And as part of our way of operating, we like to provide people with education. And that extends to you, those folks who refer to us. So we provide educational content uh, at least twice monthly on Mondays uh, for CEUs, for those of you who are so needing them. Uh, that is what Care Patrol does. And we're so pleased to have you join us today. Our topic again is principles of clinical ethics and their application to practice. Greetings to everyone and thank you for speaking. We do love to have you join in the discussion. So hello, uh, Thomas and Sharon and everyone else who's spoken. Um, we appreciate you being here and appreciate you adding your voice to mine. I know that uh, everyone on the call is benefited when you add your input your outcomes, your observations to those that I bring to the fore. So we appreciate you for interacting in the chat room. If you're new to Zoom, as some of you may be, and you're not sure how to access the chat room, move your cursor to the top of your screen and a little black bar should pull down on which the word chat is written. Click on that. If that doesn't happen when you move your cursor to the top of your screen, Move your cursor to the bottom of your screen and the little bar will pop up that has chat on it. Click on that and join in the discussion. Um, we are accredited by for 1.0 contact hour today for nurses by the Alabama Board of Nursing and for social work by the Alabama Board of Social Work. Each of those entities uh, accredit us uh, so that we might provide 1.0 contact hour in ethics for today's uh, course. Um, There's so many of you coming in. I'm just letting folks in as I discuss and go through our housekeeping elements. Uh, those of you who've been with us before know that we use an online evaluation tool called SurveyMonkey and that we provide a password protection for that survey such that you must listen to the entire hour before you can take the evaluation and you must complete an evaluation in order to receive credit for today's hour. That evaluation, as I've said, is password protected and we give the password out at the end of today, but you must complete the evaluation in order to receive credit. So as we've got a pretty good number of folks in here now, I will read for you, for those of you who are driving or working at your desk or otherwise not able to see our screen or chat room, I'll read for you, and it's on the screen as well and in the chat room, I'll read for you uh, our evaluation link for today, which is https 
colon forward slash forward slash www dot survey monkey dot com forward slash lowercase r forward slash all uppercase letters and some numbers six T as in Tom, six, B as in boy, Q, S, X. And as we've had a number of people just join us again, I'll read that one more time for you to make note of it. If you have a pen or paper or using your phone to make notes or going ahead and putting it in your browser, the survey link for today is https colon forward slash forward slash www dot survey monkey dot com forward slash lowercase r forward slash all uppercase letters and numbers six t is in tom Six B is in boy Q S X. And again, I've placed that in the chat room for you. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for being here. Please do remember that we encourage and want to have your input and discussion throughout this. Uh, everyone who completes the evaluation, which again is password protected, we give the password at the end. Everyone who completes the evaluation will receive a certificate for 1.0 contact hour in ethics and nurses. We will be uploading your hours to the ABN website on your behalf, which is what the ABN asks us to do. As we get started, let's look at our, uh, our objectives for today. Uh, for our uh, topic, which is principles of clinical ethics and their application to practice. One is we want to define ethics in clinical practice. Um, two is we want to list and discuss the four main ethical principles that affect clinical practice. And lastly, we want to run through some case studies to show where there might potentially be ethical conflicts and get your input as to what those might be or what may override, what, what ethical principle may override another. Those are our objectives for our contact hour, principles of clinical ethics and their application to practice. And now that we are mostly all here, let's get started. And I'll start by asking you, what is meant by ethics? And we'd love to see uh, your uh, input in the chat room, which again, you can access uh, by moving your cursor to the top or bottom of your page. What do we mean when we talk about ethics? What is ethics? Anyone can answer that question. I hope you'll take a stab at it yourselves. What do we mean by ethics? I see that no one is in the mood to talk yet. A manner in which we do not harm others or ourselves, says Miss Lee. The values and principles that guide responsible interactions and relationships. Very good, Mr. Casalaro. Uh, doing things the right way in order to make everything safe and fair to everyone. Morals and values, standards, professional values, being true. Uh, great answers. Moral choices, values, right from wrong. These are all terrific answers. Thank you for your input. We appreciate that. Uh, the concept of what's right and wrong, says Ms. Elder. Thank you for your input. Well, ethics, as we can tell by our definitions, professional morals, values, and standards to guide practice, says Ms. Saeed. Ethics is a broad term. It covers the study of the nature of morals and specific moral choices that we must make. And within ethics, we will look at normative ethics and normative ethics attempt to answer what are the general moral norms for guidance and evaluation of, contact, of conduct and which of these general moral norms should we accept 
and why should we accept these general moral norms? So there are some moral norms for right conduct that are common to all of humankind, uh, and they transcend cultures and regions and religions and other group identities like families, and these constitute what is known as common morality. Uh, and in this case, you might just look to the Western notion of the Ten Commandments, wherein we say, do not kill, do not harm, do not cause suffering to others, uh, do not steal, do not punish the incident, tell the truth, as Ms. Calder says, do not hurt others, uh, to obey the law, to nurture the young or the dependent among us and to help those that are suffering or rescue those in danger. Those are common moral principles that exist across all cultures. I had the good benefit as a young person to do some traveling, and I spent a little time among the hill tribes of Western Thailand on the border of Borneo, uh, and I was with them and needed to bathe, and there was a pipe that had been run from a stream some, some ways away that uh, there was a little mechanism by which you would open the stream of pipe and bathe under this, this pipe. And I was not the only one who needed to bathe that day. There were others. And so all of these folks who were from the hill tribes within Western uh, Thailand and had had very little exposure to Western culture or Westerners in general, I was really astounded to note that a line had formed at the shower, so to speak, and that that was something that they knew within their culture, just as I had been taught within mine to form a line. And we would both accept and agree that once that line was formed, that breaking that was not appropriate. You would not break line in that culture or in Western culture. And so that could be considered to be a common morality, standing in line, not breaking line, taking one's turn. This would be a moral norm, a common morality within the aspects of normative ethics. And then we might look at particular moralities and these are moralities that refer to norms that exist within certain cultures or religions or professions. And these would include the responsibilities and professional standards and so forth that we must adhere to. So one example of particular morality is the clinician's accepted role, and you've accepted this as a clinician, to provide competent and trustworthy service to your patients. To, to reduce the vagueness then of an accepted role, such as if there were any vagueness around whether to stand in line and wait one's term, uh, turn rather, clinical organizations like the um, Alabama Board of Nursing or the Alabama Board of Social Work or the National Association of Social Workers have codified these standards to reduce vagueness and complying with these standards may not always fulfill the moral norms as sometimes codes that are enacted professionally are enacted, it seems more to protect the profession's interest than to offer a broad and impartial moral viewpoint from which to act or to address issues of importance to the patient. So then I'll ask, we've discussed normative and particular uh, moralities. What are the four main ethical principles that would reside underneath these? What are the four main ethical principles? Does anyone know the four main ethical principles that are associated with uh, clinical work and clinical care? What are the four main ethical principles? Anybody want to take a guess? Social justice, says Ms. Tony. That's, that's certainly justice is one of them. You're correct. Um, what are the four main ethical principles? Value the worth of the individual. Confidentiality is a subset, Ms. Lee. 
what are the four main ethical principles? Do no harm. That's correct, Miss Orndorff. Do no harm. What are the four main ethical principles? And how do we value the importance of human relate? Oh, Miss Dean, value the importance of human relationships, integrity. Integrity is certainly part of it. Self determination uh, is one aspect that we'll discuss. Autonomy, Mr. Casalaro, you hit it on the head. Autonomy is one of the ones that we are looking for. Do good, do no harm, choose freely, and justice, Miss Richardson. You've just about got it. Justice. Ms. Smith, you are correct. Justice is one of the four main ethical principles. In fact, the four main ethical principles, as many of you have so well guessed, are beneficence, number one, non-maleficence, number two, autonomy, number three, and justice. And each of you, or the congregation of each of you is responding, hit upon these four now, informed consent, truth-telling, and confidentiality, which some of you spoke about, originate from the principle of autonomy. And what we'll show here today is that the conflicts that are between ethical principles as guiding patient care, the conflicts occur most often when we contrast beneficence or doing good with autonomy, which is the patient's right to elect and choose a course of action. So when we look at these four main principles of ethics, beneficence and non-maleficence can be traced back to Hippocrates, who stated that we are to help and do no harm. The latter two, autonomy and justice evolved later and evolved socially in the West much in the 18th and 19th centuries. In fact, in the 18th and 19th century, Thomas Percival's book on ethics, which was a, a long standing uh, treatise that people were directed to read, uh, stressed the importance of keeping the patient's best interest as a goal, but he did not in that book discuss autonomy and justice. However, these have gained acceptance as important principles of ethics over time. And in the classic book, Principles of Biomedical Ethics, which many of you may have studied by Beecham and Childress, these four principles, beneficence, non-maleficence, autonomy, and justice are discussed, and there are alternatives discussed to adhering to these as well. So beneficence is the obligation of the clinician to act for the benefit of the patient. And this beneficence supports a number of common morality or moral rules to protect and defend the rights of others, to prevent harm, to remove conditions that will cause harm, to help those with a disability and to rescue persons in danger. This is beneficence. And beneficence, in contrast to non-maleficence, is a positive. It's positive language with positive attributes and positive requirements. This principle of beneficence calls not only for avoiding harm, but also for benefiting patients and for promoting their welfare. And it conforms to the moral rules we've stated above, uh, the common morality, and it is altruistic, meaning it is selfless. So you must take upon beneficence on yourself in a selfless application. Now, non-maleficence is the obligation of the clinician to not do harm, to not cause harm. And this supports several moral rules, common moral rules, such as do not kill, do not cause pain or suffering, do not incapacitate, do not cause offense, and do not deprive others of the goods of life. Do not steal, for example. The practical application for you then as a clinician is to weigh the benefits or the beneficence against the burdens of all interventions and treatments, non-maleficence. Avoid those that are inappropriately burdensome 
and choose the best course of action for the patient weighing beneficence and non-maleficence against one another. Particularly, this could be important when we are looking at end-of-life care decisions, when we are thinking about withholding or withdrawing treatment, which is medically, even including medically administered nutrition and hydration, or in masking pain or other symptom control. The obligation to relieve suffering by the appropriate use of drugs, including opioids, may override the foreseen but unintended harmful effect or outcome. So the beneficence at end of life of administering opioids may outweigh the non-maleficence, which is that those opioids may cause the patient's breathing to slow to a point where they stop breathing. So beneficence and end of life may outweigh non-maleficence when these two ethical rules are contrasted. Thirdly, we're looking at autonomy and the philosophical notions of autonomy were developed first in the 18th century and then in the 19th century, first by Immanuel Kant and later by John Stuart Mill. And we've accepted these in our society as ethical principles. And it stated, according to them, is all persons have intrinsic and unconditional worth and therefore should have the power to make rational decisions and moral choices, and each should be allowed to exercise his or her capacity, remember that word, capacity for self-determination. Now, not only was this positioned or posited by philosophers, but this was actually codified into law when Supreme Court Justice Cardozo in 1914 ruled that every human being of adult years and sound mind has a right to determine what shall be done with his own body. That's an important legal distinction. Autonomy, however, needs to be weighed against competing moral principles like beneficence or non-maleficence and autonomy when weighed in some instances may be overridden by these. An example would be, very easy example would be if someone does something to harm someone else. Yes, they are autonomous. It is an autonomous action, but it is not morally right. Now, autonomy, as we've stated, and I said to be careful uh, about capacity, does not extend to persons who lack capacity to act uh, now, in healthcare and in government in the U.S., we have policies and procedures where we can assess competency, and there is a distinction between incapacity to make healthcare decisions as assessed by healthcare professionals and incompetence, which is a ruling in a court of law. However, the clinician's determination of a patient's lack of decision-making capacity uh, has the same practical consequences as the legal determination does. So the legal determination of incompetence and the clinical determination of lack of capacity are one uh, and the same. Now, detractors of the notion of autonomy in clinical ethics question the focus on the individual and propose that we adopt a broader concept of relational autonomy, which is to say autonomy that is shaped by relationships, gender, ethnicity, and culture. So the United States is a non-homogenous culture. We are a melting pot, as each of you know, with people hailing to our country from all countries and from some minority populations where views are different from that of the majority white views of the United States. And in the United States, the majority white population has a need for full disclosure, whereas others from more ancient cultures may not. Ms. Thrasher says, that is why it's so important for people to be educated and to know how to fill out advanced directive wishes. We all need to do this while we are still competent so that family will have a guide on what to do. That's exactly right, Ms. Thrasher, and we'll touch on that today. 
you may find that if you're dealing with someone from an ancient civilization, an ancient culture that's rooted in beliefs and traditions, that the paternalistic practice uh, of clinicians may come mostly from beneficence. In other words, you may be acting on their part um, through a beneficent belief. However, you may not be acting correctly. Culture is not static and autonomous and changes and changes over time. In fact, there's been a social movement towards emphasis on the patient as an individual and not as a member of a group. However, you may find that it is group related with persons from different cultures. So respecting the principle of autonomy obliges you as a clinician to disclose medical information and to disclose treatment options, the benefits of and the negatives of that are necessary for the patient to exercise their competency and self-determination. This supports informed consent, truth-telling, and confidentiality. So autonomy supports informed consent and truth-telling and confidentiality. Now, you all know that the requirements of informed consent are that a patient, one, must be competent and must be able to understand what you're telling them and must be able to make a decision based on what you're telling them. So the requirements of informed consent are that the patient must be competent, must receive full disclosure of their treatment options and their disease state, must comprehend that disclosure, must act voluntarily and not with coercion, and must consent to the proposed action. Now, these can be met with resistance, as each of you know. Um, Marcia Angel of the Harvard Medical School wrote, quote, there must be a core of human rights that we would wish to see honored universally despite variations in their superficial aspects. She continues, the forces of local custom or local law cannot justify abuses of certain fundamental rights and the right of self-determination on which the doctrine of informed consent is based is one of them. So self-determination and the doctrine of informed consent are basic to clinical ethics. Autonomy is basic to clinical ethics. Now, competence is the first requirement as we've discussed for informed consent. And we generally have standards for determining incompetence based on the patient's inability to state a preference or a choice. Um, we understand that someone may not be able to understand their situation and its consequences, and they may not be able to reason through a consequential life decision. And in that case, or if they were previously autonomous, uh, as Ms. Thrasher said above, but presently incompetent, we hope that they have advanced directives, which will express their preferences, which we are to respect. If they are incompetent and non-autonomous and previously competent, but presently incompetent, in lacking uh, advanced directives, we would need to locate a surrogate decision maker. And the surrogate can use either substituted judgment or other standards in substituted judgment, we, the surrogate would determine what the patient would wish in this circumstance and not, very importantly, what the surrogate would wish. Now, a best interest standard would be uh, another substituted judgment standard the surrogate could use. And in that case, they would weigh the highest net benefit to the patient by weighing the risk and benefits of the proposed treatment plan or they may use so-called substituted interest, which is to say uh, adhering to the patient's authentic values and interest and basing their decision upon that. So in the absence of advanced directives, knowing 
for example, that the patient did not wish to be kept alive uh, then uh, through, you know, intervention, then base the decision upon that. Truth-telling is also part of autonomy, and truth-telling is a vital component in the relationship between you, the clinician, and your patient. An autonomous patient has the right to know full disclosure of his or her diagnoses and prognoses, uh, but they have the option to forego this, this disclosure. So full disclosure, however grave, was not always the norm. In 1961, 88% of physicians surveyed indicated that they preferred to avoid disclosing a diagnosis, whereas in 1979, just 18 years later, 98% of physicians indicated that they would, they would, would disclose the diagnosis and prognosis to the patient. So you can see that was a swift change and it is very much true today that we think of full disclosure as being a stronghold of our ethical obligation. And in fact, surveys in the US show that patients with chronic diseases like cancer wish to be fully informed of their diagnoses and prognoses uh, and providing full information with tact and sensitivity here should be the standard. So when giving disclosure. Remember the caring elements of being a clinician and hold someone's hand or touch them lightly, speak softly and clearly, allow plenty of time and space for the patient to uh, acknowledge and understand what you are saying. Uh, and we see that the consequences of not telling the truth could be dire. They could deprive a patient of uh, wrapping up things at the end of their life, which is so important. Now, confidentiality is also a part of autonomy, and we are obligated, as each of you know, through HIPAA, not to disclose confidential information by the patient to any other party without the patient's authorization. Now, just because of the way that, that the healthcare system is, this can be eroded, and this is why HIPAA compliance is so important. And we know that as clinicians, you must exercise discipline in not discussing patient specifics with the family members of the patients or in social gatherings with your colleagues or over social media, certainly. Uh, we know that. Now, some noteworthy exceptions to patient confidentiality include the legal reporting of a gunshot wound or of a sexually transmitted disease and other exceptional situations that may cause major harm to other persons. For example, uh, during the epidemic, we had to disclose to others uh, who had COVID. Uh, we might consider that we would disclose to partners that uh, our patient has been found to be HIV positive. Uh, or we might see that uh, certain relatives need to be made aware of certain genetic risks that have been uncovered, such as a spouse uh, finding out that a certain genetic disorder resides in the other spouse's genetic code and must be taken into context when looking at having children. And then justice, which one of you mentioned, uh, is interpreted as fair and equitable and appropriate treatment of persons. And how this comes into play most often and is most pertinent in clinical ethics is what is known as distributive justice. And distributive justice refers to the fair, equitable, and appropriate distribution of healthcare resources. So distribution to each person an equal share according to need according to effort, according to contribution, according to merit, and according to free market exchanges. Each of these principles is not exclusive, but rather can be combined in application. So again, distributive justice states that there should be distribution to each person 
an equal share according to need, according to effort, according to contribution, according to merit, and according to free market exchanges. And it's easy to see how it could be difficult to choose and balance and refine these to form a coherent and workable solution to distribute medical resources such as we saw during COVID. Now, another flagrant example of a violation of this would be when a particular option of treatment is chosen over others, for example, an expensive drug over an equally effective but less expensive drug because it benefits the clinician financially or otherwise. We're electing for someone to run in a trial, which is not necessary, may not help that patient because it benefits what something that the clinician is trying to do in terms of doing a drug trial. Now, there are many conflicts when we take into account beneficence, non-maleficence, autonomy, and justice. And each of these four is to be taken as a prima facie obligation. Prima facie means on the face of it, and it means on the face of it, this is generally accepted as true until proven otherwise. So each of these four principles, beneficence, non-maleficence, autonomy, and justice, is to be taken as being wholly true unless proven otherwise, and unless they conflict with another principle. So when faced with such a conflict, you, the clinician, have to determine your actual obligation to the patient by examining the respective weights of each of these prima facie and competing obligations of beneficence, non-maleficence, autonomy, and justice. Consider, for example, a patient who is in shock. You treat them with urgent fluid recitation, resuscitation and place an indwelling catheter. This indwelling catheter causes the patient some discomfort, some pain, and some swelling. But we would all agree that this is the correct action, and we would say that this is a principle of beneficence overriding that of non-maleficence. Yes, we are doing some harm, but on the whole, we are doing good. So another example might be a patient's refusal, a potentially life-saving intervention, or their request for potentially life-ending action, such as someone who's undergoing chemotherapy who elects to stop treatment and go on hospice. In that case, there's really nowhere in the arena of ethical decision-making is a conflict as pronounced as at the end of life or in other instances when principles of beneficence and autonomy collide. So defining the responsibility of the practicing clinician or a defining rather responsibility of you as a practicing clinician is to make decisions on patient care in different settings and with different uh, present presentations of patients. These decisions involve more than simply selecting the appropriate, appropriate treatment or intervention. Instead, ethics is inherent and inseparable and is part of clinical medicine. You, as a clinician, have an ethical obligation to benefit the patient or beneficence to avoid or minimize harm, non-maleficence, and to respect the values and preferences of the patient, autonomy and justice. Now, we talked a little bit about paternalism. Beneficence has an historical role in medicine. And in fact, we've pointed out that it dates back to Hippocrates with the very advent of medicine, do no harm and do good. However, if we enact beneficence over patient autonomy, we are engaging in paternalism. And paternalism makes the client or clinician and patient relationship much more like the parent to child relationship. A parent or child, a father or mother may refuse a child's wishes. We all know this as parents. Uh, or we may influence the child's decision through a variety of means, such as non-disclosure, not telling the child everything about their condition, manipulation, 
deception, which is outright not truth telling, coercion, or other means because we believe that we are doing what is best for the child. So if we do in clinical medicine, what a father or mother might do to influence their child and put the child's best interest over the child's ability to self-determine their own interest, then we are moving beneficence into the arena of paternalism. And this is an ethical no-no. And in fact, there are other limits to our clinical ethics. The other end of the scale might suggest, well, if we can't put our interest or the person's best interest at first, then we're limited to simply providing the medical information and their available choices for interventions and treatments while allowing them, now fully informed, to select from these available choices. However, if you sway to this line of thinking, you are not using your full knowledge and expertise and experience and skills to benefit the patient. And that could be considered a form of patient abandonment. And patient abandonment is always, in every case, ethically indefensible. So then we need a practical approach to problem solving in ethics. This would involve one, our clinical assessment, identifying the medical problems, the treatment option, the goals of care, the limits of care, the adverse effects of care. This would be to involve also the patient. And in our case, our goal here is to clarify the patient's preferences on the treatment options and goals of care. Uh, we must also take into consideration quality of life effects of both the medical problem as presented and the problem of the interventions and treatments on the patient's quality of life with awareness of how our own individual biases on what constitutes an acceptable quality of life need to be put aside. An example might be uh, a young teenage athlete who comes in during an automobile accident and has severe damage to one of their limbs. And it's determined that we must remove one of their limbs in order for them to best survive. Um, and so it may be that while we would see that the quality of life of the person would be enhanced without that limb because they would live, we have to understand this might be a young athlete who feels like losing that limb would hamper that thing they love most, which is their performance of their athletic activities, and they may decide not to, uh, to want to do that intervention. And we have to understand that our sense of their quality of life and their sense of their quality of life might differ dramatically. And this would be the context that would include many elements, not only family or cultural or spiritual or religious or economic or legal. So there's an example of uh, those coming into conflict, but how we might look at the principles of ethics and patient care being applied would be our clinical assessment complies with the beneficence and non-maleficence dictates of clinical ethics in which we, during our clinical assessment, uh, understand the nature of the illness. Is it acute? Is it chronic? Is it reversible or is it terminal? And what are the goals of treatment? We would detail those treatment options and with those, the probability of success for each option to the patient. We would also tell the patient the adverse effects of these treatments and ask whether the benefits outweigh the harm, such as the amputation, an example I've given. Uh, we might look at the effects of not doing anything, no medical or surgical treatments and what that might look like. In this case, it might be the loss of life of the teenage athlete. And then if we do discuss and discover that treatment is warranted, what are the plans for limiting or stopping that treatment? So the clinical assessment conforms to beneficence and non-maleficence. Respect for autonomy is when we take into consideration the patient's rights and preferences. So we've given information to the patients on the benefits and risk of treatments and the patient has understood this information 
and the patient who is competent and has capacity has given consent. Uh, we might look at if the patient is not mentally competent and if they are, what are his or her preferences? If the patient is mentally incompetent, are the patient's prior preferences known? And if preferences are unknown, who or what is the appropriate surrogate? Is there an advanced directive? Patients' rights and preferences and respecting those is respecting the right of, of autonomy. Now, when we are discovering how these intercede or align beneficence, non-maleficence, and respect for autonomy come to fore when we are looking at quality of life, the expected quality of life of the patient with and without treatment, uh, their deficits per the treatment, physical, mental, social, uh, judging the quality of life of a patient who cannot express himself or herself, and determining who then is to judge for determining the quality of life of this patient, the recognition of our bias possibly in judging quality of life, absent a surrogate to do so, and our rationale for foregoing, if we are foregoing, life-sustaining treatment. This is where beneficence, non-maleficence, and respect for autonomy align. So let's look then at some case studies to see where our ethics align or intersect or overridden one by the other. The first is we're presented with a 56-year-old male lawyer who's a current cigarette smoker who's had a pack-a-day habit for more than 30 years. Upon assessment, we discovered that this patient has a solitary right upper lobe pulmonary mass and lung cancer, based on our test and our experience, is the most probable and significant diagnosis that we could make. We explain this to the patient. The patient understands our treatment plan, which is chemotherapy and radiation and surgery, and the significance of not delaying treatment is explored. However, the patient refuses treatment, states that he does not think he has cancer, and is fearful that the surgery would kill him. Which ethical principles are affected in this case study? Is it autonomy? Is it justice? Is it beneficence? Or is it non-maleficence? Or is it in a combination of all of the above? Mr. Consolero, Consolero excuse me, says autonomy, the right to self-determination. Combination of all, says Ms. Tony. Autonomy, says Ms. Coons. Well, the prescribed treatment is the removal of the mass that is probably cancer, which would afford the best chance of cure and delay in the cancer reaching an incurable stage. But however, the choice by this well-informed and competent person should be respected. Autonomy, as you all have said, prevails over beneficence in this case. Another case study. We have a 71-year-old man who has very severe COPD, was admitted to the ICU with pneumonia and sepsis and respiratory failure. He was intubated upon coming in and mechanically ventilated. However, as we look at his history, we see that in the past year, he's had two admissions to the ICU, and on both occasions, he required intubation and mechanical ventilation. And since coming to us today, he has drifted into a comatose state. What ethical principle should we employ in this case? Ms. Tony says non-maleficence and autonomy. Does anyone else have a clue? If What are the ethical principles affected by this patient who has had a history of COPD, uh, has previously been admitted to the ICU, is on mechanical ventilation, and has drifted into a comatose state. We have non-maleficence and autonomy. And here we would say that in this case, beneficence prevails over non-maleficence. In other words, the good that we can do is overriding the non-maleficence that we will do, which is to remove this person from mechanical ventilators and vasopressors the patient has no advanced care directives or a designated health policy, 
proxy, excuse me, and we deem this person to be medically futile. Now, this is open to different definitions and is often controversial, but would it be appropriate here uh, to discuss the patient's condition with his family with the goal of discontinuing life-sustaining interventions? Beneficence for sure, says Mr. Consolero. Consolero, excuse me for mispronouncing your name twice. We have here another uh, case example, which is a 67-year-old widow who is an immigrant from Southern India and lives with her son, is brought into a teaching hospital by her son, who informs the doctor that if any serious life-threatening disease is found, not to inform his mother, but instead to tell him. She has pancreatic cancer and chemotherapy, while not likely to cure, will prolong her life. What do we do in this case? The son has asked us not to inform her, but we know that she needs chemotherapy, which can make a great difference in her quality of life. What ethical principles are affected here? Autonomy and beneficence, says Ms. Calder. Well, we have said earlier that there may be ancient cultures that adhere to different standards than our Western ideals. And in this culture from Southern India, authority is often given to the male member of the family, particularly the senior male. And that person is tasked with making decisions that involve other members. So given this cultural perspective, the son then can rightfully claim to make healthcare decisions for his mother who has given him over to that. We must respect their cultural values. We must learn the patient's preferences, but we must also comply with the American norm of full disclosure to the patient. And in this instance, we have to refuse son's demands. In fact, the principle of autonomy prevails over beneficence here or paternalism in that we have to provide the patient the option to delegate that decision-making authority to her son. Therefore, the appropriate course of action is to ascertain and inform the patient of her condition and to then ascertain whether she would want her son to make those decisions for her or whether she would prefer that all information be made by her or rather by her son. Do we know if the, we do know if the mother agrees with the cultural norm? Well, we, we expect that she does because that's the culture from which she hails, and we are all uh, imprinted by our culture. Uh, power of attorney, mm, mm, may not come into play here unless one is presented. Um, I think in this case, uh, full disclosure and autonomy overrides the son's wishes. Last one. During a COVID-19 pandemic, a 74-year-old woman comes into the hospital from an assisted living facility and has shortness of breath. We test her for COVID-19 and she tests positively for COVID-19. She was admitted three years ago to the assisted living following a couple of strokes that left her paralyzed on one side. Another patient is brought in directly after her, a 22 year old man who lives alone, who's had symptoms of flu for a week. But the past two days, these symptoms have worsened progressively and he is tested and result confirmed positive for COVID-19. Both of these patients are in respiratory failure. They are both in urgent need of intubation and mechanical ventilation. However, only one ventilator is available. Who gets it? Which of these affected, uh, uh, which of these ethical principles are brought to bear here? Ms. Calder, I think, says contact the ethical committee of the hospital immediately when presented with this, and I would say that is the true, uh, the right thing to do. But barring that, what would we decide? Well, 
it's not up to us to determine who lives when not everyone can live. The general social norm, as we discussed earlier, to treat everyone equally and on a first come, first serve basis, as I discussed when we were talking about queuing into line, first come, first serve. That is not the appropriate choice here. However, maximizing benefits can be viewed in a couple of different ways. In lives saved, or in life years saved, and these differ. The first is non-utilitarian, lives saved, they're equal. Life years saved is utilitarian and is not equal. So we want to maximize the, the benefits and doing so, these patients differ in terms of life years saved. Additionally, we see that the young man is more likely to survive this mechanical ventilation and in possible infection and possible complications. And the American College of Physicians states that allocation decisions during resource scarcity should be made, quote, based on patient need, prognosis determined by objective scientific measure and informed clinical judgment on your part and effectiveness which is to say the likelihood that the therapy will help the patient to recover to maximize the number of patients who will recover. In this case, justice prevails over beneficence. So the need to treat all equally is overridden by the justice of life years saved in this capacity. So in conclusion, let's just say that our virtues are linked to our principles, both normative and subjective, principles of ethics. Compassion is a prelude to caring, it is expressed in beneficence. Discernment is especially valuable in decision making when principles of ethics collide. Trustworthiness leads to trust and truth telling, which is an aspect of autonomy and needs to be put into place when patients are at their most vulnerable, which is when they're seeing you. Integrity involves the coherent integration of our emotions, knowledge, and aspirations while maintaining the moral values of beneficence, non-maleficence, justice, and autonomy. And clinicians, as clinicians, you need both professional integrity and personal integrity and conscientiousness, which is required to determine what is right by critical reflection on good versus bad, better versus good, logical versus emotional, and right versus wrong. Medical knowledge is the skills to apply, and the medical knowledge rather, the skills to apply that knowledge, including technical skills, practice-based learning and communication skills, partner and should partner with our ethical principles and professional virtues. The virtues of compassion, discernment, trustworthiness, integrity and conscientiousness are all necessary building blocks when it comes to the virtue of caring. And caring is the defining virtue for all health care professions. The secret of the care of the patient is caring for the patient. And that concludes our CEU for today. I'm putting again into the chat room, the survey monkey link, which is https colon forward slash forward slash www.surveymonkey.com forward slash lowercase r forward slash all uppercase letters six T is in Tom six. B is in boy, Q, S, X is an x-ray. I put into the chat room now our code word for the day, which is conflict with a capital C. It's also on the screen in front of you. Conflict is the code word, capital C, O, N, F, L, I, C, T is today's code word. I've given you the link and the code word. You must do the evaluation to receive credit. Everyone who does the evaluation will receive a certificate. Please do the evaluation by eight o'clock tonight when it closes so that I can get your CEU certificates out to you tomorrow. 
And nurses, remember, we'll be uploading your CEUs to the ABN for you. Thank you all for referring to us, and I know that many of you do. Please remember when referring to us, it's much easier on the referred person if you get their permission to give us their contact and name and, and contact number so that we can reach out directly. This saves them from making another call, and we're able to explain initially when we speak to them that our services are free to them. Thank you all for being here today. I appreciate everything that you do uh, and appreciate you for being here today. Thank you for everything. Uh, and uh, we will now conclose, uh, conclude our CEU um, for the day. Uh, if I can find out how to do that. Um, thank you for being with us. Uh, please join us on Monday when we uh, are going to do animal assisted therapy with Holly Mask, who's done this with us before. We look forward to seeing Holly on Monday, August 5th at noon. Thank you all for being here today. Uh, and thank you for everything that you do. Have a great week ahead.